Okay, welcome back everyone uh, to the Jerry Malloy Negro League Con Conference, Zooming live. Uh, getting ready to go into uh, our great panel discussion. Uh, this panel will talk about the announcement that Major League Baseball made in December to include the seven Negro Leagues as major leagues. And a lot of attention has been paid to the statistic, statistics associated with the players and the teams. Now our panel of three will focus on black baseball before 1920, however. Our panel of experts, I consider them the goats of the 19th century baseball. We'll discuss the foundations laid by those playing in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And without these men and women, the latter efforts of Ruth Foster and so many others would not have been possible. Who were these players, teams, owners that took part before any official Negro Leagues was created? What was life like for a black player in the years after the Civil War? So let me introduce our panelists before we have a seventh inning break. In alphabetical order, we have James Brunson III, an art historian who specializes in American modernism. He is the author of the three volume work, as you see on the screen, Black Baseball from 1858 to 1900. Also, the early image of black baseball race and representation in the popular press. And this essays and articles have appeared in the Negro Leagues were major leagues, a book by Todd Peterson, and other publications, including Black Ball, a Negro Leagues journal. Next on our panel is Todd Peterson. He lives in Overland Park, Kansas, nearby, and is a visual artist historian and teacher. He's a two-time winner of the Tweed Webb Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Research and was a contributor to and an editor, chief editor of the Negro Leagues were major leagues. Peterson is currently working on a book about the Negro Leagues playoff, which I'm really looking forward to. John Thorne is the official historian of Major League Baseball. Apart from his creation with Pete Palmer of Total Baseball, he was also a major on-screen presence in and senior creative consultant for Ken Burns' PBS film, Baseball. Check out any number five. And with Palmer, Thorne wrote The Hidden Game of Baseball, which established alternate statistics later recognized and adopted as official by Major League Baseball, notably the OPS, on base percentage. His many baseball books over the past four, decade, four decades also include Treasures of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Baseball in the Garden of Eden, as you see pictured here. Since 2011, he has published weekly at his blog entitled Our Game. We're going to get started here. Uh, as a baseline for our discussion to our illustrious panelists, uh, talk about how you got started in 19th century baseball and why you're fascinated by it. And we'll go with uh, James Bronson first. Well, first, let me say good evening to everyone. And uh, I am honored to be a part of this prestigious uh, trio today, this evening. Um, my interest in 19th century baseball happened quite accidentally. You know, I've, I've always loved the game. I played the game as, as a toddler and a teenager. I played Little League and, and Pony League. But, um, you know, after I got into college, I kind of put it to the side. And um, as I moved along in college, uh, I you know, gravitated more towards uh, the fine arts and painting, which is what I got my uh, bachelor's and uh, fine art master's degrees in. And eventually I got a, a PhD in um, art history. But uh, I was doing some research for a series of paintings I wanted to do in 1985, a series that I call the Renaissance series and I wanted to devote particular attention to um, images of uh, 
black cultural production at the time from 1895 to about 1945. So in the process of doing this research, I was looking at old newspapers on microfilm. We didn't have the great digital newspapers that we have today at that time, of course. And uh, I was looking at the Cleveland Gazette, which is a black newspaper. It was a weekly. And I came across an article, however very brief it was, about a black ball player named Isaac Carter who played for the St. Louis Black Stockings in 1882 and 1883. And then the article stated that he had been killed while engaged in a burglary uh, in the house of a well-known doctor in St. Louis. Now, I covered this story yesterday, and I think it's important for me just to briefly point out that there are some issues of concern with the story which appeared in St. Louis's three major newspapers. The first thing, and again, you have to read all three accounts from all three newspapers in order to put a composite story together. Uh, Isaac Carter was considered uh, a, a very good shortstop for the Black Stockings. And uh, the fact that he, he was a coachman for a wealthy white family as well, so he had plenty of time to um, enjoy playing the game. Um, very light complexion gentleman with uh, wavy hair. And uh, when he was killed, his body was found on the top of a, um, a coal bin uh, two stories below where he had been found. The doctor came according to the story he came into the room of his German, one of his German servants, a female servant, and um, Isaac Carter was there. And according to the doctor, um, he shot and killed um, Isaac Carter as a burglar. Now, there's two problems with the story. The first thing is, uh, according to the police accounts, uh, he was shot at close range. And the second was, uh, well, there's three things. The second was when the police came upon his body, he's dressed to the nines. He's got on a black suit, black bow tie, white shirt, uh, shine shoes. And again, it's in the details of the story. And the third thing is, if he's engaged in a burglary, it's odd because it was 5.30 in the afternoon in the summer. So uh, I suspect with that story, as far as I'm concerned, is that there was something else going on there. I suspect he was probably uh, intimately connected to this German servant girl. And um, that was really one of the reasons for his demise. Um, it impressed me so much the story, the original story of him being uh, killed that I pursued who the Black Stockings were. And uh, in the pursuit of the Black Stockings, I've discovered these other Black teams in um, St. Louis, along with a Black team that was organized in 1870, 1871, called the St. Louis Brown Stockings, which was the first Black professional team that I'm acquainted with that acknowledged them being knowledge themselves being uh, a professional team. In fact, they advertised in the New York Clipper for a catcher and a left-handed pitcher in 1871, which again fascinated me. Um, outside of that, um, I found out that the St. Louis Club played the Black Clubs of Chicago and uh, I moved forward from there in expanding my interests and in discovering, which led to the writing of the Black Baseball book, 1858-1900. Thank you, James. Uh, Todd? Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, again, uh, great to be on this panel. Uh, I think my introduction was, again, through like a team. Mine was the uh, St. Paul Gophers, and it 
started with uh, Robert Peterson's book, the uh, Only the Ball Was White, like I think a lot of people's entry into uh, black ball history. And I was just looking through his great player index and I noticed there were uh, players who played for a team called the St. Paul Gophers. And they got me thinking and interested in it. And like James, I'm a, a visual artist and I, <laughs> it's, I work kind of intuitively and the, the Gophers started popping up in my, uh, in my images. Uh, it's sort of the way things go sometimes. And so I started doing research about them at the uh, uh, Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul. And that uh, led to, uh, you know, traveling all over the Midwest to societies and uh, uh, just researching the team and eventually writing a book about the team. And at the same time that would, uh, you know, because a lot of the guys started playing uh, in the 19th century, that sort of led me to the 19th century. And I'm kind of uh, kind of stuck there now <laughs> uh, with with the playoff book because those uh, those guys played a lot of games, um, you know, from 1860s on. They, these guys all over the country, as James demonstrated in his uh, great book, they're uh, they've been playing. They were playing for so long all over all over the South and North, and uh, so it's just a, it's an amazing story, and it's uh, just um, one that never stops to uh, interest me or intrigue me. John, you're next. I think uh, scholars may be made, but researchers are born. And those kids who are digging around in piles that their peers are ignoring are the ones who make saber, who make um, lifelong researchers. Now, when I first began to be interested in baseball history after uh, college and grad school, um, I thought the greatest book, the greatest books both came out, 66 for one, that's Glory of Their Times and Harold Seymour's first volume of baseball, which had been 1960, his second volume with Dorothy was 1971. As the dead ball era became more popular among researchers, I had this boyish inclination to find something that was mine. So I kept going back farther and farther and farther, or further, I suppose, into the past. And by 1981, 82, 83, my area of deep interest was the fundamental question of how baseball began, who invented it, what are the lies that have been told? And most interestingly to me, why did people bother to lie? Because the lie <laughs> tells you so many things about a person while the truth is a fairly bland proposition. And 28 years after commencing this uh, sort of research, I had amassed so much material that I felt I would die with it. And, um, Luckily, uh, my health uh, held up and I was able to do Baseball in the Garden of Eden, the <laughs> 11, culminating 28 years of work. And um, it is something of a miracle that um, it was published, that uh, I lived long enough in good health. And in that very same year, uh, Commissioner Selig named me official historian of Major League Baseball, which is a very agreeable post. And the 19th century continues to have a hold on my imagination because everything, whether it's automobiles or rock and roll or movies, is most interesting to me when it begins, when there are decisions that are made, when there are forks in the road, and how the institution is to grow and develop and what is left behind, these are of paramount interest. Let me just add quickly, Larry, that yes. John, John can be uh, modest and gracious and his use of the word, I was looking for something that I can call my own is, is a gift of prose as far as I'm concerned. And certainly my interest in black ball and what I found and what I discovered that was not out there uh, was something that I wanted to write about and what I thought others would be interested in. So. Again, uh, kudos to John on the word, something that could be my own. That would be my focus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, John, would you like to 
uh, retaliate? <laughs> well, there's no retaliation. James and I are the best of friends. I hope, I hope there's no retaliation. And we admire each other. And, we, and this afternoon, we were going back and forth about our next visit on my home turf. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, Wonderful. <laughs> so, so no, no, no. Todd, I have not known to this point, and I'm delighted now to call him my, my friend. Well, good. It's, I was thinking about the presentation before we began, and uh, I'm looking at probably two decades with you, John, and 15 years with Todd, and 10 years with uh, James. So I got about 45 years invested in you gentlemen. So, <laughs> and Larry, you're our pal for sure. That's right. That's, That's right. Larry. Just, Larry, just don't come to collect, because <laughs> you're not going to get too much. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll, I'll send my, well, okay. <laughs> we'll get back on topic here. I love you guys. Uh, why is this period of baseball before structured league play, why is it important in the creation and the foundation of baseball historically? Well, I, th I think it, it leads to league play. That's the whole, that's the whole deal. So it's just sort of all these, great teams all over the country playing and keeping the game going and starting the game and just sort of um, in the black players like Bud Fowler uh, going all over the country, uh, uh, spreading the game and uh, just kickstarting it and keeping it going and making it a profession uh, for uh, the African-American and um, from way back, I mean, I, I there's, the, you know, even way back when there's distinctions between, you know, town teams, amateur teams and professional teams. And even in the 1870s, I'm finding mentions, and I'm, you know, sure James does as well. It is, you know, especially when a squad would really defeat another squad badly, they'd say, "Well, we lost. Those guys were professionals. We lost those guys. That team from uh, Nashville or Knoxville, that was a professional team that beat us." So even back, you know, as James has established, even back then, you know, the, the early days, they're professional teams um, and professional players. So it's not something new, but it led. A long process that led to uh, the Negro National League in 19, 1920 and, and eventually uh, integration. So it's a, I think that's why it's important. It's such a, you know, a, a long journey, but a, a definite, definitely an important one. Can I pile on to that remark, Todd? I think early baseball is interesting, not because of what it leads to, but because of what it is. Yeah. And and to me, Bud Fowler is the signal character of the 19th century. Uh, you can look at Govern, you can look at Bridgewater, you can look at organizers, but Fowler was a player and an organizer. And most important from my perspective is that he links us to baseball players of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, whose names are unknown because Fowler was a barber. And if you were a barber in that period, you could cut the hair and shave the face of white people because it was permitted. So the idea of intersection with baseball as a white game in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and black culture as represented by the barbering trade is to me a really interesting story. And it's one that James has covered very well. And, and John, you hit the nail on the head on the barber, so I'm not going to touch on it unless you all want to elaborate. But um, I, I wrote down some comments, which certainly brings us to what you talked about with um, uh, Bud Fowler. In 1882, Henry Bridgewater collaborated with John W. Jackson, a.k.a. Bud Fowler, James Dudley, and Jay Harrison, or Jane, James Harrison of Richmond, Virginia, who all um, were part of the uh, Richmond Swans. And again, here you got Bud Fowler all, already again in the mix down there in Richmond, Virginia, a part of that team. And here he is collaborating with uh, Henry Bridgewater who uh, just that fall of uh, 1882 was down in New Orleans playing for the Pickwicks. And uh, what I discovered was, um, in their formation or their attempts to form a National Color League in, in uh, 1883, that uh, Henry Bridgewater 
was communicating not just with the teams out of uh, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Richmond, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Washington. He was also communicating with teams in Colorado, black ball teams, uh, Denver, Leadville, Colorado Springs, Longmont, Greeley, Idaho Springs, and Lawson, which is just fascinating to me. Now, and, obviously, and we know that. Played for Pueblo. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So it's the the dynamics of this. I mean, there's there's a lot of vignettes, stories that can be told that you know really haven't been delved into in detail. And again, it's important for anybody that's out there and doing research. They need to take these things into consideration. Great, uh, you, James. You talked about barbers. Are there any? Well, other John stories? talked about barbers. I just kind of jumped in there. Okay, John and James. <laughs> You talked about barbers. Are there any other service industries uh, connected to baseball during that period? You bet. Waiters. Exactly. Exactly. Waiters are, uh, we, we can't understand or appreciate it. Uh, you know, this current book that I'm working on, a book project that I'm working on, Blues People, uh, Music Style and, and Baseball, uh, 1865 to uh, 1910, uh, tracks down and, and, and again, going back to Todd, he was gracious enough to include an article that I had written uh, about this. I see Saratoga Springs, New York as the hub of black baseball from the early 1860s down to about uh, early 1890s. And many of the guys that became professionals honed their skills as waiters at Saratoga Springs hotels. And these guys plied their trade in the North um, at Saratoga Springs hotels. And uh, in the fall or the winter, by the mid 1870s, they went and played winter ball in these Florida hotel resorts as well. So again, the, the connections between um, the movement towards amateur to professionalism is intimately linked with uh, Saratoga Springs. Yeah, and I, and I think previously, you know, before James pointed out, I think people thought, well, that, well, that's interesting that this hotel had a bunch of really good players. <laughs> you know, their, their waiters are so good. But what we find out is these hotels want a good ball team. So they're hiring these guys to you know, ostensibly wait tables, but they're, they're professional ball players. And that's what, that's what they're there for is to do is to play and play other hotels and, and play well. So it's not just, boy, they got lucky. That hotel really got lucky with boy, all those guys can play ball. It's amazing. All those guys can play ball, but there's a, it's the network was so vast and, you know, you know, ball players know who good ball players are. And they say, well, this guy can play and let's bring him in and um, you know, SK Govern and those guys. Um, so it's, it's no coincidence that those, those waiters are so good. And James can also, I think, talk about, you know, steamships and how, you know, the, the river and how uh, the rivers and how that was connecting, connecting players and, and throughout the country as, as, as well. And minstrel shows also supplying ball players. We have a, we have an all black minstrel troupe going to Australia I think in 1867 or 1868 and playing baseball against Australians. So the idea that black baseball was geographically narrow or was conceptually narrow is an idea that needs to go bust. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly, exactly. And as Todd has, has, had pointed out, uh, the, the piece that he so graciously included in his volume uh, black ball teams work for luxury steamers as well. And uh, they plied their trade from as far north as uh, New York all the way down to Florida. They also plied their trades on um, the Mississippi River, the um, Ohio River, and the Colorado River. So um, clearly they had to not only be a network of uh, black ball waiters, there also had to be methods of communication that, at least from my vantage point, I'm not clear on it. There must have been some other newspapers and advertisements that I haven't come across yet, but I still try to dig uh, that explain how these folks became aware of each other. For example, 
Um, one of my favorite players uh, is William Billy Speed, who was a student at the Hampton Institute in, in uh, Virginia. Now, he was also a, uh, a musician or a vocalist for the Jubilee Singers at uh, Hampton Institute. And he worked, and this was in the 1870s, early to mid 1870s, and he worked as a waiter uh, in Saratoga Springs. And uh, it appears to me, based on the evidence, that the, head, the black head waiters that worked at these restaurants, they also, I mean, hotels, they also seem to have required not only that you have baseball skills, but that you had other entertainment skills for the uh, people that stayed at these hotels, which included singing, being able to uh, do theatrical productions, and a host of other things, which is just mind blowing to me. So these folks, uh, you know, we use the, the term uh, five tool player, but <laughs> as it relates to these hotels, these, these guys had to be three and five tool players as well in order to get a job at one of these hotels. Oddly, this mirrors the development of white baseball in its earliest amateur phase. When ball clubs were started, they were started as social clubs and the ball playing was an activity secondary to the post game dinner. And it was only with the advent of Brooklyn ball, particularly in the late 1850s, that the Atlantics, the Putnams, the Excelsiors, some of the high class clubs started recruiting lower class kids who could play ball. They may not, they may not have the social <laughs> skills to, uh, to lift the glass after the game, but uh, yeah, winning counts. Yeah, well, it, you know, I, I've seen mention of that too. I mean, like in, like in I think it was uh, Chattanooga, the CU Whites James, they had like a second nine. So you have these teams that not only have, they have their first nine, first squad, they have, mm -hmm. You, know, you have black teams with two squads, which is, I think that's mind boggling to me as well. And these, these cities have so many good teams, like Memphis has like four, Memphis has four good teams that are, that are playing, you know, I mean, eventually one rises to the top, but you have all these, all these, all these cities have not just one team, but many, many teams playing, playing all over. So it's just, and playing each other and and only, you know, only I think only a percentage gets in the newspapers that we can still find today. But it's, it's just, you know, they, I think they're playing a lot. And at least every Saturday or Sunday, these guys are out there playing and, and then and then traveling as well. You know, One, uh, interesting. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Baseball historians are good at lying, or baseball <laughs> writers are good at lying. And um, there are tales that are told and repeated with. Uh, purported authority. So I was probably yesterday old when I learned that the Argyle Baseball Club of Babylon, Long Island was not the first professional baseball club. Uh, it was um, the, the St. Louis Black Stockings. Uh, I'm indebted to James for setting me straight. <laughs> oh, come on, John. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me offer a, a quick um, story to Larry, if I will. Okay. Uh, there was another color league that uh, appeared in 1884 that got national attention, but you know was rarely talked about, if at all, and that involved teams from Pennsylvania and Maryland, and it included uh, the towns of Shippensburg, Harrisburg, Carlisle, Baltimore, Hedgestown, and of course Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Now the standout team uh, out of that league, of course, was the Harrisburg Olympics, but the team that I love to talk about that held their own was the Chambersburg's Alerts, which was captained by a guy named William Wilson, AKA Buddy Guy. Now, um, the thing that is fascinating about it for me is that they were winning so many games during this year that the Baltimore Atlantics, which was a professional black team said, well, let's see what these guys are about. We'll take them on. And uh, of course, uh, the Baltimore Atlantics had their way with the alerts, but the thing that is fascinating is that there were two players on that team, a William Tate Taylor, and in one of those games, he struck out 19 of the Baltimore Atlantics, and these were supposed to be the professionals, and they had a catcher named Ben, ben Scott that was so good in the first game that the Atlantics were wary of trying to steal bases against him. 
Now, the Atlantics were especially impressed by Ben Scott because I suspect catches were a rarity in 1884 to, to find. They offered this guy $40 a month to play with them. And interestingly enough, he turned them down and stayed with the alerts. Okay. Uh, we talked about the St. Louis Black Stockings. Can, can you tell us about its owner, Henry Bridgewater? We just put a marker on his unmarked grave uh, this month. Well, I was excited to hear about that. And uh, I have a marker in my book and I'm just gonna read real quick through it. What I think is uh, interesting to hear. Um, first of all, Henry Bridgewater. And again, I wanna thank John for giving me my first published article on black baseball, him um, publishing it in uh, his book, uh, Baseball, The Early Game, which again, mm -hmm. really, you know, sent me on my way. Uh, Bridgewater was born uh, in 1842. He was enslaved. Um, and it appears that his father may have been white. His mother may have been a very light complexion mulatto. Uh, he was eventually uh, adopted by uh, a gentleman um, named Bridgewater from where he got his name, who also happened to be John, a barber <laughs> in uh, <laughs> in uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And uh, with that, uh, they eventually moved to St. Louis, but uh, the Wanderlust captured Bridgewater and he moved to Chicago in about 1864, just before the Civil War. And he worked at one of the Chicago hotels and played baseball there. When the war started, uh, he packed up his stuff and he served as a uh, servant slash attendant for a surgeon in the U.S. Army. And uh, he cut his teeth there, and I'm pretty sure he saw a few baseball games being played during that time. He came back to uh, St. Louis, and he worked as a barber, he worked as a waiter, and he worked as a porter on a um, steamship on the Mississippi called the Red Wing. And the Red Wing traveled from uh, all the way from, uh, it was out of St. Louis, but it traveled from New Orleans all the way up into St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he undoubtedly played on that team because um, the Red Wing steamer had a baseball team, a black ball team. By 1882, he was back in St. Louis uh, and he married a woman that was fairly well to do and uh, he purchased a saloon. His saloon was so popular, and, I, and I'll do the quote right here. Bridgewater Saloon was a social magnet for the National Colored Sporting Fraternity, entertaining the era's, uh, era's celebrities of color, among them pedestrian Frank Hart, baseballers Bud Fowler, Australian pugilist Peter Jackson, jockey Isaac Murphy, the colored archer, comedian and musician Sam Lucas, and the prize, vi prize fighter Harry Black Diamond Woodson. And um, the thing that I find fascinating at this time is when he had organized the Black Stockings, he is the second, not the first, he is the second uh, Black Ball owner slash uh, manager to take a team on a uh, national tour. Bridgewater played black and white teams. Uh, he left St. Louis and moved through. He, where he played in Detroit. He played games in Detroit. He played games in Canada. I think he played about eight games in Canada. He came back through Ohio, played white and black teams. He went down into uh, 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 Kentucky and uh, eventually fought his way back through uh, Michigan again and um, Indiana. So uh, this guy's uh, the 1883 championship season, which is what I call it. Uh, this guy had done something that hadn't been done since 1871 when the Chicago Uniques traveled the country following uh, a route that I think the Black Stockings were well aware of. Uh, the Chicago Uniques went through, um, they played in Michigan, they played in Canada, 
They played in Ohio, and this is 1871. They played in Pennsylvania. They played in Washington, D.C., and they played in New York. So again, I'm sure there's some other stories, but the Bridgewater story really stands out for me because it's on the cusp of uh, what became that ill-fated uh, Negro National Colored Baseball League of 1887. All right, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, Todd, as we're talking about owners, what can you tell us about the St. Paul Gophers owner, Big Daddy Reed? Well, interestingly enough, it's going to be uh, uh, St. Paul's going to honor him on Tuesday. It's going to be uh, Phil Reed Day in St. Paul. I didn't and know honor, that. Uh, yep, and honor him and the Gophers. Uh, not it, not coincidentally. I mean, he got started in St. Louis, of course. So it's he was a. And he was a porter on the railroads and well-known uh, throughout the land, it's said. And he eventually moved up to uh, St. Paul and opened, uh, worked, worked in restaurant and bars and eventually opened up his own bar with a childhood friend. And um, he was a leading figure in St. Paul community. And also uh, he had his kind of among his friends, Rube Foster and Jack Johnson are among his uh, pals. So he's a, a major figure and he started the Gopher team in 1907. And in 1909, they, uh, Beat, beat Foster's squad uh, without Foster for the uh, <laughs> one of the contenders for the national championship that year, but they're a great, great team. Um, and they, you know, also would they played the Saints a couple uh, in 1907 08? They played the Saints uh, of the American Association and, and did quite well against them. So he was a, a tremendous figure, a great owner. When he died, uh, there was uh, it was uh, standing room only in the Pilgrim Baptist Church, and they were like, 2000, 2000 people outside the church. So he was just a uh, tremendous figure in, uh, um, you know, Minnesota history, St. Paul history. And uh, it's great. The uh, saints are going to uh, honor him and the city of St. Paul is going to honor him on Tuesday. Great. Uh, Scott Bush just posted a link in our chat window window uh, that, that would take you with, to more information about Phil Big Daddy Reed. Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the leagues of 1883 and 1887. For those who are not aware, uh, these were the early black leagues that failed to survive a full season. Would anyone like to talk about either of those leagues? Well, I, I, I was going to follow up, uh, okay. I think, on uh, James's point. I think it's interesting to me there was a lot of leagues all over. And they, I mean, they, they would start off in cities and towns like Washington had a, a league in 1880. New Orleans had a, a, a league. Um, I mean, Rube Foster, I think, I think he got the, you know, didn't get the idea for organization, but he played in a league, the Texas Colored League in the uh, late, uh, you know, very late 19th century. Uh, the Ye Waco Ye Yellow Jackets were on a squad. And he was on that squad and uh, the Fort Worth Wonders. So I think, they were always trying to organize leagues. Uh, 1886, the Southern, uh, <laughs> the greatest title of all time for league, the, uh, the, the, the League of Southern Colored Baseballists, um, I'm mangling it, of course, but I mean, that 1886, that lasted uh, a couple months. And then in 1887, the National Color League was formed um, with, and I think when you go into it, you see, well, they just got a bunch of teams, but the teams they had in there were great, great teams, um, established squads in many cities. I think they had trouble with transportation that year. Uh, the rates with the railroads, uh, something was going on. that made it very prohibitive for them to travel and that kind of uh, really damaged the league. And the fact they couldn't get the Cuban Giants in the league. Also, I think they, so that was the big card. If they could have gotten the Giants in there, who knows how long they could have lasted. Um, but they're, you know, very established squads uh, playing in that league. Um, you know, the Pittsburgh Keystones were a, a, a team for many years in, in, in Pittsburgh yes. were playing. Uh, the Boston uh, uh, Res Resolutes, I think, um, a, a well-established team in Boston were playing. Uh, the Louisville, uh, I think it was the Fall Cities in there. And that was a mm -hmm. well-established squad. So these are, you know, teams that um, kind of the Pythians, they were kind of a revived. It wasn't the old Pythians as a new squad, but very, you know, established squads to try to give it a go. And um, I think it was just uh, monetary reasons they couldn't couldn't make it. And, and, not, and again, if they would have the Giants, I think they could have lasted quite a bit. Yes, and they also had a lot of rain outs early in the season. Yeah, yeah. So bad luck. Yes. Anyone else like to talk about these defunct leagues? 
I will say, Larry, that I am less interested in the leagues than in the pioneers of black ball. Okay. You know, we, there's a lot of talk in Saber and perhaps among our audience today about who's in the Hall of Fame and who's out and who ought to be in and what kind of campaign can we make for him. And um, I frankly don't care. I'm not interested in adding a single additional player to the Baseball Hall of Fame from before 1920, whether he be white or black. But I think there are some sorely neglected pioneers. And if I had to pick two to make it to the Hall of Fame, one black, one white, it would be Bud Fowler and Doc Adams. I understand okay. that his, his daughter, uh, his-, his um... Great granddaughter. His great granddaughter passed away a few days ago, right? Correct. And, and she was a very powerful advocate for his getting into the Hall of Fame. But I think the, the idea of advocacy for other people to do something that you can do yourself, which is have high regard for an individual all by yourself. I, I've said, and many of you have heard this before, that I have a Hall of Fame between my ears that's superior to the one in Cooperstown. <laughs> content with that. <laughs> Point taken. Okay, John. I'll, that's that's pretty good right there. <laughs> All which, right. Which is which is good, but until we can visit there, I would love to. <laughs> which would be awesome. So, David, I, I'd well, still I'm, like to I'm see. I'm telling it. you, if 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 John, if you ever got a chance to visit John in his beautiful historic mansion of course he wouldn't call it a mansion but i do it's voluminous it's huge this guy has artwork and his study he allowed me to study uh to do some research while i was there and, and use that study quietly as he graciously sat in his long the long corridor of his ha hallway and did his own work and uh I i'll never forget and John, I'm droning on here, but bear with me. I'll never forget, I got up one morning, my wife was, or my deceased wife now, was still asleep. I got up and John made that uh, chock full of nuts coffee. I had a cup, I sat out on his porch and watched the sun coming up over the mountains and John's out there in his robe and we're just having this long chat as the sun rolls in the sky. It's, it's a romantic scene that I'll never forget. And chock full of nuts is the coffee in my house because it's Jackie Robinson as executive vice president. There you go. There you um, have it. I know that's right. <laughs> well, thank you for that moment. But Todd, tell us about some of the uh, personalities or icons you think need more attention yeah, and recognition. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with John. After, after I think we get 25 more black players in, I won't care either. <laughs> so I, I, I promise. So it's, it's, once yeah, we ought, level, but we ought to be out of the plaque business. You know, yeah, well, it's advocating for somebody you know, else it's, it's, something that we think is correct. Is it, it's it's a but, Sisyphean uh, movement. Yes, it, I think, I think it, it, it keeps artists employed, uh, John. So it's good. It's, <laughs> well, it's black well, makers. I have to jump jump in here though. Um, uh, John says Bud Fowler and Doc Adams. I say from. Uh, the black players, definitely uh, Bud Fowler, but I would add Henry Bridgewater and uh, my favorite, Walter Lewis Cohen from New Orleans. Yeah, uh, those are guys great. are pioneers and- Organizers, uh, yep. They, they, they deserve, uh, a, there's been a biography written or two on uh, Bud Fowler, but Henry Bridgewater and Walter L. Cohen deserve biogra bi biographies uh, on their, um, I think, pioneering careers. Oh, and I would add one more, and that was the grievous omission from 2005, 2006, and that's Buck O'Neill, who was outside- Yes, sir. Logical period. Yes, sir. You got it. Yes, sir. Well, I think now we're up to 30, and then we'll stop, so. <laughs> like we'll, we'll cap it, we'll cap it, we'll cap it right. at 30. Just, just one more. Just, just one, one more, just one more, just one more. You know, we've, but... we've only got time, right? Yeah, so it's. <laughs> what about George Stovey? Uh, George, well, I, I got a list. They got Harry Buckner, who was a, a great, I mean, talk about a, yes. player, a great pitcher and hitter. Um, yes. He hit about 474 against major leaguers and, you know, limited amount of games. Uh, Bud Fowler, 
Um, Abe, a lot of Cuban giants, Clarence Williams, George Williams is a tremendous hitter. Yes. Uh, th those guys, Arthur Thomas, uh, going to the, going to the early dead ball era, you got, you, you know, you got Spotswood Poles, mm -hmm. Annie Hall, um, Bill Pettis played all over. I mean, John Donaldson, of course, you know, a, a great, a great, great, great pitcher. So, so, I mean, Dick Redding, I mean, there's these guys, <laughs> You know, I promise I won't care anymore after that. But I mean, these guys, I think, deserve consideration. I'd love to see the Hall do something, and I, I, I think you just can't stop and say we're done, uh, and that's it, guys. You, it, I, I can't. I, I have one. I have one bit of research breaking news on the George Stubbe front. This yeah. man, whose likeness we have never seen, but. Oh. Joe Williams, who is part of the 19th Century Baseball Research Committee and the Overlooked Legends, uh, ch chairs the Overlooked Legends Project, has found three or four images of Stobie yeah. we are working to get in high resolution. Wow, mm -hmm. impressive. Now, here's my question. My question, John, since you brought him up, um, in some of the earlier accounts, regarding Stovey that come out of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, it was claimed that he came from ca uh, Canada. It's, have you found any evidence to substantiate that or is that myth-making or lying as you call it? Well, my research on Stovey would fit in a thimble, so I ought not to be the one to speak to this. <laughs> oh, y'all <are> myths. <laughs> Gentlemen, we are... Well, you like this, Larry, before you get off there. Somebody on the chat said, uh, I think it's Sherman Jenkins. He says, cap it at 40. <laughs> there you go. There. And then no more. We promise. No more. No more after that. So Maybe we'll I got one more. And I, 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 I'll write, I'll sign something. I promise not to care after we get to 40. I, I promise. <laughs> no, All you right. Don't. You, you All keep right. pushing it's a deal. it. You'll keep pushing it, Todd. No. All right, we we got a time for one question. Any thoughts on the insights on the Pythians of F Philadelphia and Octavius Cato, who they just built a statue to in uh, at, in Center City Square, and others who, in addition to baseball, were involved in justice struggles in Philadelphia? That might be a too broad of a question, based on the lack of time that we have. But go for it, gentlemen. Well, Pythians had an ally in the athletics. Uh, yeah. they had a, a white club willing to speak for them and the athletics sensing that the application to the National Association in the state of Pennsylvania was doomed to failure, cautioned them to back off rather than face an explicit blackball. Um, the Pythians uh, were a very powerful club. Cato appears to have been a very good second baseman and perhaps a hitter. And um, their place in baseball history is legendary because of their rejection. That, that is the principal thing about them. Well, but they're also a great team. I mean, they were uh, maybe black ball champions for a number of years there. So they were the, the best black team in the country. So a very good squad. Um, and unfortunately, it stops right when Cato's assassinated. That's kind of the end of the Pythians. I think James... Uh, uh, suggest they turn into another squad called the Williams team, which we don't know. Williams call we don't that know that much about, but um, and they're again and um, they don't pop out of nowhere. They come, you know, after the, after the war. They're here's the Pythians, but it's a great squad with many many good players, and um, and beating playing everyone, playing Washington, uh, playing uh, playing Chicago. They split a series with the Uniques, uh, a couple games. So. Not only, I think not only politically important, but also, you know, a, a great team. So well, one, of the, one of the things I have to point out, uh, and I shared some of this information with Todd, you know, we communicate back and forth, uh, and certainly we'll get better with it as we mellow with uh, the wine that makes us who we are. Um, the, the Excelsiors, we have to remember, yeah. uh, what was overshadowed by the Pythians, and they, they, organized before the Pythians did, at least by several months. But at the same time in 1866, there were several other black teams in um, Philadelphia playing at this time. There was a team called the Ruin. Uh, there was another team called the L Overtours. And 
the team that sticks out to me the most was a team called the, um, and the name is escaping me right now, but it'll come back to me. But that team was significant because they had several players that the Pythians and the uh, Excelsiors absorbed into their teams. And the picture of note, and I repeat the picture of note that uh, came to the Pythians came from this team whose name again escapes me and I'm gonna find it before I uh, disappear here. But uh, 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 John Cannon, uh, yeah. uh, is that John? Yeah, that's John, yeah. John, John Cannon was a pitcher that uh, the Pythians acquired. And this guy created fits for both the Pythians and the uh, National Excelsiors before he was uh, uh, snatched up by the Pythians. And I think also, James, I think you can push. I mean, there's the, the very famous event with the, um, and you've shown this to be a very famous event where the uh, Pythians are the first squad to play a white team. But yes. in, in fact, it's, it's, I think we're pretty sure it's the Excelsiors are playing a team called the Hornets, maybe in New York. Yes. Uh, um, a year a year before, like 1866. So it's, you know. And, and it, again, think, uh, the, the thing that's fascinating, uh, Todd, and I think we talked about this as well, the Pythians traveled to Saratoga Springs, New York, as yeah. you know, I talked about earlier, and they played in a tournament with teams from uh, Chester, PA, from uh, Wilmington, uh, Delaware, a team called the Lincoln Club. And uh, it's, it's fascinating, again, trying to track down the names and the players, and I'm sure somebody will do it if we don't, but we need to recognize that uh, black baseball is really a complicated affair that requires, as John pointed out, researchers who are born. And, and maybe have OCD. Uh, that would be helped. So yeah, it's, OCD. Yeah. OCD. Yeah, I think it it helps quite a bit. I, 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 I resemble that remark. I, I, I resemble it a lot. So I, I'm just bringing it. I think it's. Like, let's drill. Let's drill down on the Pythians a little bit more. They have complete records at the Free Library in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, they kept scores of all their games. The scorecards are available for all three years that they played in the league, or played independently rather. And it's kind of fascinating. They have financial records. Uh, four names, and they had three teams, the first, second, and yeah. third team that traveled. Four, four, Larry, they had four teams. I stand corrected. <laughs> they had four teams. And, and so- And again, I, uh, your your friend, uh, and you know who I'm talking about down there in uh, Harrisburg, <laughs> took me to the library, your friend, that's right, <laughs> Ted, took me down to the library and I scrolled through all that stuff and printed all that stuff out. When I saw that they had four teams, yes. I was, I was stunned. <laughs> in 1867. Well, I could have sent you copies. They let me copy it also. Well, <laughs> anyway, I was trying to find my way, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is you you discovered more information than you than you ever wanted to discover. That's right. It was uh, illuminating. Yeah, very detailed records were kept. And it, it reduces the myth that uh, African-Americans are apathetic about their history when you look at the Philadelphia Pythians records. Yes, yes. Ticket sales, yeah. what the expense reports, game scores, everything in great detail. And again, that those records led me to discovery of uh, the names of players or secretaries for teams that uh, you never would have discovered. Uh, the L Lincoln University Baseball Club that became prominent in the 1870s, uh, they were known, uh, they played against the Pythians in 1866 and 1867. They were known as the Ashman Institute before it became <laughs> Lincoln University. Wow. So again, that led me to do some research on the Lincoln University and they had these annual yearbooks and they still exist. You can mm -hmm. trace all the players that played for those teams right up until 1874. Yeah. And, and some it, of those college players played for the, uh, the Baltimore team in the 1887 National Colored Baseball League. Yeah. It's, it's, not always the, it's not always the box scores you're looking for. It's often you know, just the, the stories about organization of teams or, or 
as as James finds out, just who's working on a staff of a hotel. Because you go through those names, and you say, "Wow, you know, that's that's the ball team right there." So yes, it's sir. yes, sir. It's, and there was also on that Baltimore uh, um, team in 1887, there was a guy who came from West Africa to get educated at Lincoln University. He also uh, played for Baltimore clubs in uh, 1886 through 1887, which again is mind blowing to think that somebody was a native of West Africa that was here on uh, to, to get an education, also played baseball here. So it's a fascinating, again, the narratives are fascinating. Okay, we talked about uh, Octavius Cato a little bit in his political involvement. Are there other politicians involved in uh, this period of black baseball, such as Frederick Douglass's son? Uh, anybody want to take that on? Charles Redmond Douglas. Well, that, I mean, the Douglas Club, they was part of that league, early league, 1880. There was a team, the Douglas Club was, uh, and it, he played for it, um, was, uh, you know, one of the, um, one of the first uh, black leagues. And they had like, you know, four or five teams. They played, they played when the, the national team from Washington was away. They went and played on the national ground. So it was quite a big deal. And they were on, I think the Nationals were on tour and, and the league would go there and play their, two, three times a week until um, the league abruptly ended when <laughs> the Nationals got back. That was, that was, that was, that was the end of the league, guys. But, um, and, you know, I think it might have been called the White Lot or something. Uh, in, in the Washington. White Lot is directly behind the White House. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So think of that. I mean, so <laughs> how's, that, how's that for an image? In, yes. in, in 1880, you have this Black League carrying on right behind the White House. So it's... Um, uh, um, quite, quite something. Well, uh, f for me, Larry, and I'm, I'm moving away from the Pythians uh, ever so briefly, mm -hmm. um, Walter Lewis Cohen of New Orleans, uh, either playing for or managing or doing both for uh, several black ball clubs of that, uh, of, the, of the Pelican City is fascinating because he was also a hardcore Lincoln Republican at the time. And his involvement in Republican politics is the longest running um, tenure of any uh, black Republican in the history, if you wanna link it to baseball. Uh, this guy was actively involved in uh, Republican politics, beginning with reconstruction and he continued to be actively involved in Republican politics until his death in 1930. So from 1874 to 1930, this guy was actively involved in Republican politics, which again is amazing to me. Okay, I'm gonna throw, you, I'm gonna throw you everybody a curveball here. What impact do you think Reconstruction had on black baseball during that period? Well, Reconstruction provided a brief period of harmony, or at least tolerance. And uh, it is during this period, and, and I'm going to turn you a little around, Larry, and you can bend me back if you like. <laughs> okay. We have those of us who are beyond the point of hearing that Jackie Robinson broke the color bar, was the first African-American to play in Major League Baseball. And all of us on this call, on this uh, Zoom session, already know that. But many people on this Zoom call will continue to maintain that the Walker brothers broke the color line in 1884. That's Fleet and Weldy. And I hold that it was the Reconstruction era and the ability of slaveholders after emancipation to realize that their mulatto children needed to be educated and sent to the North that gave us Major League Baseball's first player, William Edward White, who played one game for Providence in the National League in 1879. There are those who say he later passed for White, you know, like 40, 50 years later, 
So he, that disqualifies him. I don't think it disqualifies him at all. And I think his credentials are impeccable because he was born in slavery. I don't think you can get better than that as a black ball player, the first black ball player in major league history. So you'll forgive me if I have wrenched your narrative and you can pull it back. <laughs> you sure have. You can can you, it. Can, can and I can, thank can, you for it. That, that's a good way to start that off. And again, uh, some of the research that uh, I have done and I'm continuing to do uh, certainly points to what you talked about, John. And I also owe a debt of gratitude to uh, sports historian Michael Lomax, who raised the issue of the impact of mulatto ball players on uh, 19th century black ball. And when I initially started working on uh, my uh, three volume work, Black Baseball, uh, one of the things I wanted to focus in on was this notion of mulatto players and the impact that they made on the national game. You know, and as I started looking at these guys and started doing these uh, census accounts to look at who these players were, it became so ridiculous that so many of these guys were mulattoes, I just stopped doing it. it, it <laughs> like, what is the point? And I think yeah. uh, the, the issue that you raised, John, about uh, these, um, uh, 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 ball players who were enslaved, not just in the South, but in the North, um, who uh, gave their uh, sons a chance, particularly in areas where uh, they had an opportunity to succeed as barbers, for example. Uh, you look at um, Utica, New York, and the um, Fearless Ball Club, uh, there these guys were composed as early as 1866. They were all barbers. And many of these guys were so light-skinned that they can pass for white. And you don't have to take my word on it. You can do your own research on Utica, New York, and identify the names of players, which are in my book, these families, the Peterson family, uh, the, the, the Lippin family, uh, the Lippin family, for example, that father, uh, this guy was a barber, or as they called it at the, the time, a fancy hairdresser or tonsorial artist. Tonsorial specialist, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's quaint now, but uh, I, I love it. Uh, this guy uh, was a barber in Utica in the 1840s, and uh, he raised his three sons and they all played baseball. And, you know, you would have been, it would have been difficult. And I haven't found any photographs of them, obviously, but the stories and, and the accounts that are given of the, the dad, uh, you know, this guy could have passed for white. So I just think it's important, again, for anybody that wants to do any serious research on this, you've got to drill deep. Okay. And just pop in and say that Henry, Henry Rosecrans, a barber in Kingston, New York, just 20 miles down the road from me, he gave an interview to the Kingston leader in the 18, late 1870s, early 1880s, in which he said he recalled playing baseball while he was a slave. And New York State did not end slavery until 1827. So this was, this is to my knowledge, the only find to date of an African-American slave playing baseball. We, we know that Douglas played ball of some sort, um, but it's not identified as baseball. And, and the fascinating so, thing, John, uh, about what you just said, and we talk about research, uh, after having conversations with you about Rosecrans, you know, I went back and started looking at some of those New York papers and never just take one uh, newspaper to say, this is it, I've got all the evidence I need it. I found two additional papers thanks to John's, uh, my conversations with John and these interviews, like the interview with Rosecrans, 
there's three interviews and they're like heavily edited depending on what newspaper you read. And one of them is expansive. I mean, it just goes on and on and on about this guy's life. So never take for granted what you see. You can grab it, hold on to it, but drill deeper. Okay. Uh, John, I'm gonna push back on your <laughs> claim of William Edward White. The research is solid. Probably the first black player in Major League Baseball. But race is a human construct. And we use that to organize ourselves and others into groups. And this construct is often, not always, but often relies on outward appearance. And William Everett White appeared to be white. On his marriage license, he puts down white. In the city directory, he, he's listed as white. And on his death certificate, he's listed as white. So he passed as a white man. So he never was subjected to racism as a black man. Larry, I've got to disagree with you because we do have census records in which he is identified as black or mulatto. We yes. No, that he, his father, the slaveholder, married his mother at age 13. And he was born in 1860. He was sent north in 1864 or 1865 to the Quaker school, Friends School in Providence, Rhode Island. And from there, he went to Brown. And there's no question in my mind looking at photos of William Edward White, that his skin color was impossible to deny. That he yeah. passed for white in, cer in certain circles as years went by. Mm -hmm. and now, I, will, I will not say to you that white is more important than Fleet Walker. Fleet Walker is definitely the, the more interesting character and experienced racism in a much more profound way. But it's tough to get around a major league player born in slavery. Thank you. And, and, and let me just quickly add too that White certainly knew who and what he was as well. Uh, he also played for the St. Louis Black Stockings for a couple of games yeah. in 1883. And he also played for the Boston Resolute. So he well, knew what he right. was. And and I, I'd add, I think there's kind of a confusion about that story too. I. I as far as his origins, I mean, uh, there's a great player for the Cuban Giants, a pitcher, William White. The name's spelled the same way. Oh, yeah, he um, played for the Cuban Giants, too. I know, it's the, it's the same guy. But they have him, they have one William White they have dying in Chicago. I don't think it's, that's the guy. I think that's a different... The William pitcher, White. Will White, is different. I think they're the same. I mean, they're both from Providence. <laughs> so what are the odds of two? I mean, that's um, the coincidence here. What's the odds of two pitchers... Well, the more obvious point really is whether, whether we're going to recognize White or Walker as the first African-American in Major League Baseball history. That's the interesting question to me, not whether White had a doppelganger at some club in 1885. I don't think, think he had a doppelganger well, when he played for the Resolutes or the Cuban the, Giants the, the, or the, the no. St. Louis of... Uh, uh, black stockings. I think that's the so, William White. I, I mean, I, J John, I agree. I think William White was the first black player, but he's. I, th I think his end is can being confused. I think it. I think he went on from playing for Providence and playing for the Grays. Then he went on to the Black Stockings. Then he went on to the Resolutes. Then he went on to the Cuban Giants. I could is be it wrong. White with a Y or White with an I. Yep. Yeah, and I think they just misspelled it oftentimes. I think it's the same guy. And I, I think that's sort of been, you know, not misreported, but I think it's been kind of been confused. I, I, I think it's, to me, the odds of two guys from Providence with the same name who are great pitchers, uh, major league quality. Oh, it's, it's Todd, like, you're, sen you're sending us back to research. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I will do so <laughs> gladly. I'll, let me tell you a, a guy who was also born in slavery and, and wound up joining a colored regiment in the Civil War at age 13, and then went on to play at Oberlin a decade, no, a de yes, a decade before uh, the Walker brothers. And that is Simpson Younger, a name known to some of you. And the Simpson Younger story 
which I promised to write up at great length at our game at some point. I keep Please do, John. I keep promising to do it because I've got such great stuff. And uh, what's re what was remarkable to me was that Younger, who disappeared for three decades, reemerged through a federal writers project WPA interview in 1938, which is available at the Library of Congress. And this is the same guy who was the 13 year old drummer boy and who was the pitcher for the Oberlin Resolutes in 1867. Yes, and let me just add, and I think John knows this, uh, Simpson Younger is related and dubious dubiously to the 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 younger brothers out of Missouri who oh, were young. to, to uh, Jesse James the Jesse James crew <laughs> yes and Cole Younger John you bring you brought up Oberlin College <laughs> talk a little bit about or anyone can talk about how progressive that college was back in the day they were one of the first universities to admit women Yes, it, 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 was the, it was the place to go if you perceived of yourself as an outsider. And it didn't matter whether you were black or whether you were female, you could get a four-year education. Now, the Oberlin Prep School, which was attached to Oberlin College, as was the custom with liberal arts colleges, then my, my own alma mater, Beloit College, had an academy which uh, William Hulbert, the founder of the National League, graduated from. Um, Oberlin, people think of Walker breaking the color line at Oberlin, but there were at least five African-Americans who played at Oberlin before Walker. We have African-Americans playing in the mid to late 1860s and again in the 1870s. It, it's a terrific story. Kudos to Oberlin. Well, one of my favorite players, and I'm looking for his name right now, that also came out of Oberlin, and uh, again, for the, the, the people in the chat room, somebody might know this as well. Um, and again, I'm looking feverishly for his name. Uh, Joshua Thomas Settle uh, also played at Oberlin in the 1860s. And after his graduation, he went on to Howard University and uh, he played for two of the, the uh, best black ball clubs in Washington, D.C., the Mutuals and the Alerts. He eventually got his law degree from Howard University and he migrated to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and he uh, practiced as a lawyer. Now, the thing that's fascinating about him when he got to uh, Memphis is that he had a boarding house and one of his boarders was believe it or not, Ida B. Wells. That's right. And Ida B. Wells uh, was introduced to baseball by Settle. Yeah. And don't forget Anna Mae, Anna Mae Cooper. A lot of great women came out of Oberlin. Yes. Uh, let's get some closing remarks from each of you. Uh, we want to close out. We have five minutes and like to hear what you have to say uh, about your research or any other comments. Uh, uh, Zeus or Thanos or Captain America, either one of you can go next. <laughs> <laughs> who, did, who did they play for? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> who, did, who did Thanos play for? Before, before we do this, I think we, we should allow our elder John to he doesn't probably see himself as an elder, but he's an elder, a well-respected scholar and yeah. friend to me. I think he should uh, set the table for us here. Well, well we've been kicking sand in his face all evening. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, uh, I'm the skinny kid on this beach. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I saw those comments flying back and forth on uh, email, and I just left it alone. You, you're, you're allowed to kick sand in the face, because all of you know more than I do. Uh, hardly, hardly. But, but let me say this about the Negro League statistics. 
which are in rudimentary form presented now at baseballreference.com and probably during the off season will be presented at mlb.com after a very thorough vetting process involving Seamheads and Gary Ashwell and Elias and myself. I think we need to remind each other that stats are stenography. They are shorthand for stories. And those of us who get wrapped up in the stats and dismiss the stories are missing the more interesting part of black baseball history. Those are my closing remarks. Thank you, John. Any other closing remarks? Well, the only closing remarks I have, Larry, is, you know, you know I love these two guys, uh, Todd and, and John. And again, uh, they... Uh, inform and challenge me to be a better researcher and historian. Uh, I just, I just I thank everyone for uh, having me on the panel. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just a wingman here, so I just uh, <laughs> hardly, uh, with, hardly a wingman with you guys. But uh, so it's just, um, and I, every conversation with James, it's like, it's, you know. <laughs> It's ten, you know. It's a, it's a hundred more rabbit holes to uh, go through. So it's uh, Move I might over have Alice and Alice in Wonderland. It is. I, I I may have to burn your books, James. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> well, good. Just go ahead and start over. I'll, I'll buy I'll buy some more, but it's just like it's they're 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 they're, they're wonderful, and there's it's so many uh, areas to go, and it just because these guys are playing all over the country, it's just an amazing. So I think that's the thing that the takeaway that I've I've learned is. How far back it goes, and um, just how how organized, and uh, just how wonderful those stories are that, that John talks about. There's just incredible stories um, all over to be found and and discovered. And I, I may linger on stats a little bit <laughs> and results of games, but that's just um, that's me. But I do. Um, um, it's just uh, a, a wonderful thing, and I'm just uh, glad to see that it's. Uh, more attention is being paid to it than these these players and uh, the, these teams and these owners. Um, you know that they devoted their life to that. It's it's uh, a wonderful thing. Well, well, let me just finally add is if you know my dream is to be able to write prose as it relates to baseball history as as well as John does. He can flip a word in a minute and you know having my head swirling is you know how did he link that to this and. Um, <laughs> It's a, a, a it's, it's a goal of mine. If, if I can reach the level of prose that he uses in his writing, you know, this would have been a job well done. Yeah. All right. Well, John, when are you going to join the Jerry Malloy conference in person? Well, um, talk to Mr. Delta about it. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Mr. Lambda. <laughs> or Mr. Lambda. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, I went to Denver for the All-Star game because I thought, well, we're going to have a summer uh, without worry. But now my wife and I are ready to hunker down again. By the uh, way, my wife works in Saratoga Springs. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, we tip our hat to Sarato Saratoga Springs. Uh, more research needs to be done there. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out from your busy schedule to share your awesome history with the Sabre community. We couldn't have done it without the best and the best, and I do mean the best. You are, you are the goats of 19th century baseball research and I appreciate you. Yeah, well, ultimately, thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Larry, you, Larry, Larry, you were great. Yeah, wonderful. Excellent Larry. host. Thank you. God bless all of you. God bless you, my brother. All right. <laughs>